Hello, San Bonani, and welcome to another episode of Conversations with the Love Activist. Now, in Zulu, when you greet someone, you say Saubona, which directly translates to I see you. And so, being seen is one of our biggest core needs as human beings. It is also one of the biggest reasons why we fight when we feel unseen or are very triggered (laughs) in our conflict. And so in this episode, Quentin and I sit with Shannon Pam, our couples coach, and we talk about what causes conflict, what to do when you find yourself in a triggered state, and how to calm down so that you can see each other better and have more compassion towards one another. So share, subscribe, like, and I'll see you later because as you know, at the end, I will share the crib notes of this beautiful episode. So see you soon. So for now, I wanted to just do a quick recap of our last session where we spoke about needs we spoke a little bit deeper into needs and the fact that there's a very important need that we all have, which is to be seen. Mm -hmm. And at the heart of a lot of conflicts within relationships, be be them family relationships, be them romantic relationships, work relationships, is the need to be seen. That's at the heart of a lot of our engagements and very often the heart of a lot of our conflicts is when we're not feeling seen. So in different situations, sometimes what happens is someone's need is different to another person's need. And if we're not actually putting both people's needs on the table and engaging the situation as though both needs are important, then you start having your needs compete. And what amplifies the conflict is now you have two competing needs and in those competing needs, you don't feel like your need is being seen. Mm -hmm. So now all of a sudden you have a need that's not being met plus your need to be seen is not being met. And that is where you start getting emotionally triggered. And when we emotionally triggered, what happens is our um, our brain um, functions differently. So have you heard of a, a... amygdala hijack so basically what happens is there's a primitive part of our brain the amygdala and the amygdala is basically at the root of our brain stem here well it's like right right at the bottom part of our brain and that really controls our fight or flight response the construction is a buzzing can you believe it it started like literally earlier as we got onto the call it's so <laughs> frustrating challenges of working in COVID. let's drill into this issue let's drill <laughs> and <laughs> they will never forget this <laughs> Our primitive, the primitive part of our brain takes over. <laughs> Let me put it that way. Our fight or flight response takes over. It's kind of like if you're walking in a jungle and you suddenly see a massive bear or like a dangerous animal, you're not going to start thinking of like analytical things. Your, the primitive part of your brain is going to take over. And what you're going to think about is, do I need to fight, flight, or freeze? So fight mm-hmm. is, do I need to engage? Do I, or do I need to flight? Do I need to run away? Or do I need to freeze? Do I need to keep absolutely still and do nothing? And that is our Mm. natural response when we are emotionally triggered in a situation where we feel danger or where we feel like a need is not going to get met. Yeah. No, 100%. I'm the freeze. (laughs) So you freeze. I'm the attack. (laughs) Okay, so you fight. You you go into flight. So when you're emotionally triggered, you go into fight. And and when you're um, emotionally triggered, you tend to go into freeze. And it's really good to know what's happening when that happens. And what is happening is basically you have been hijacked in your brain and your frontal lobe is no longer engaged. And we need, we need our frontal lobe for, for really logical, coherent conversations. And we, we need our frontal lobe to have conversations that, that are almost make sense for both of you. Mm. If you're in that emotionally triggered space, what you're thinking of is your own survival. You're thinking of your own mm. needs getting met and you're not, you're not in a space for collaboration. It's very difficult when you're emotionally triggered to be in a calm enough state to hear the other person. 
it's really difficult. I mean, I don't know. Have you have you experienced that that difficulty when you're emotionally triggered to 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 be in that calm enough state to to engage and really hear the other person, or or have you had a different experience? On my side, as soon as I'm emotionally triggered, I freeze and my brain goes completely fuzzy, uh -huh. and I can't. Um, make any kind of sentences that make sense, which then makes me freeze even more because then I'm not gonna win the argument yeah. uh, because I, I literally, my thoughts are not coherent anymore. Right, 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 yeah. And, and, and Quentin, how's it for you when you're emotionally triggered? I engage. Oh. Yeah, I want to engage. I, <laughs> yeah, Sometimes but my more. engagement is a bit more blunt. So whatever, what, whatever our trigger pattern is, what happens is the more we actually engage when we're in that triggered state, the more into our triggered state we get. Have you noticed that? So if yeah. you're freezing... Uh, let's just say you freeze and you and then there's more and more you, you might freeze even more until you may break into fighting or a different state mm -hmm. and and vice versa Quentin you might want to engage in kind of a forceful way in quite a direct way for for quite a while until a point where you actually just either freeze or just something to help you to almost to come down from the trigger the ones, the, the common ones to go to, some, some uh, maybe thought starters would be taking time out. But the reason why time out doesn't always work is because sometimes we're not onto ourselves and we take that time out. And what we do in our head is we trigger ourselves more. So we take time uh, out and then we spiral all the thoughts. Oh, he didn't understand. Da, 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 da. Or she just doesn't get money. Why is she not thinking that? Da, da, da. So that, those thoughts that go around in our head in our time out is very, very important. Instead of re-triggering ourselves in the time out, what we want to do is we want to ask ourselves the question, what objectively has happened? What is my need? What is their need? How am I really feeling? What is my request? What do I need to ask of the other person in order to try to find a space or a situation that is going to best meet both needs? Mm. And sometimes that means saying, Ugh, Maybe what I'm saying I need is not really a need. It might be a want. You know, sometimes it's going, is, am, am I sitting in a place where my want is kind of in conflict with someone else's need? And then you've got to say, okay, if it's something that I want, but not something I need, what is the deeper need underneath that want? And is there another way, I, another strategy that I can employ to meet the deeper need and not get stuck in, this is the only way this need can be met. Is this making sense? Mm. So, I, I, you know, last week, we, after the call, we were able to, um, you know, do the exercise that you, you gave us with the yeah. circle and right. the quadrants where we, we put our needs and what our, our concerns are. And we were able to really strip away at the at the ones and and get to what actually are we needing and what is concerning us about our both our needs mm -hmm. and so because we were able to do that it enabled us to first of all uh, not be so triggered about the situation i think it did help to de-accelerate I, I i well we were de-accelerated already because we had just come from a session right but having a physical tool for us to go through, you know, a very deep, um, what's this thing called? Aha moment. Well, for me anyway, about where Quentin's need was actually coming from. Right. And so for me, that was really important. And it really helped me to see it from his side. And also uh, from now on has helped me. So if, for example, um, I've, like there's a, a friend who had a 30th and I was like, I can't, 
I can't overextend Quentin's need for safety more than I already have. Right. And so, unfortunately, I'll have to decline that convers that that invitation because then um, I've already, um, right. yeah, we, I went to the baby shower yes, basically okay. <laughs> um, last week. Um, and but having this language has enabled me to to really be able to have so much compassion, even when I am, or has empowered me to be able to say no to some things or yes to some things and have a conversation with Quentin without fear of I'm going to uh, be seen as wrong or stupid or, or, or whatever because now I know the source of the need. Excellently put because it is it comes down to you knowing the source of your need but also being able to communicate that and feeling like the other person also knows the source of your need so you feel seen. Both of you are now in a deeper state of seeing one another in what that need is. And from that place, it's a lot easier to navigate the minefield and not get emotionally triggered. It's not to say you won't get emotionally triggered ever, but it, but it is to say it's a lot easier because you kind of know where those minds are. You know what, if, yeah. if you push, if you step on the wrong space, you know, and you know where they are, you've done it before. Excellently put, because it is, it comes down to you knowing the source of your need, but also being able to communicate that and feeling like the other person also knows the source of your need. So you feel seen. Both of you are now in a deeper state of seeing one another in what that need is. And from that place, it's a lot easier to navigate the minefield and not get emotionally triggered. It's not to say you won't get emotionally triggered ever, but it, but it is to say it's a lot easier because you kind of know where those minds are. You know what, if, yeah. if you push, if you step on the wrong space, you know, and you know where they are, you've done it before. Now, the other thing about the exercise that we, that we spoke about last time and that you've now given a try to is it helps to keep your frontal lobe engaged. So as you're thinking and writing things down, you're staying in the space of cognitive empathy. So you're actually, you're not getting triggered to the space of fight or flight because you put taking it out of your own head and you're putting it on a piece of paper. It's not my internal dialogue against your internal dialogue. It's our, our situation on one page. So I'm curious to hear Quentin from your side, if, if anything over this last week, um, has given you an opportunity to practice the emotional empathy. So we spoke about it, that to both of you uh, are slightly, um, when, you, when, you, when you're triggered from your side, Quentin, you almost uh, quite analytical about things. So you'll go into your head and it needs to make logical sense of it. You want to try and understand it in your mind. And sometimes there's an, an emotional component, which doesn't always... Um, align 100% to logic necessarily, but that emotional empathy, understanding someone's emotions and understanding that emotional space is part of relating, well, at least part of conscious relating. And um, so I'm curious about through this week and through the baby shower and through the 30th and discussions around that, if you've had any opportunities to practice um, expressing some emotional empathy. I've had an opportunity. I think um, it's what led me on the day of the baby shower to go, you know what, go and just be as careful as you can be. And I was at peace about it. I didn't then spend the rest of my day stressing and worrying and, and, and so forth. So I, 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 I think as you're saying that at times when you are seen, mm. it's easier to understand the other person's place as well. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, so you become softer. You can soften. Uh, it's, it's easier to soften your stance. It's easier to, to, to open yourself up to a different... Yes. Point of view, so to speak. It takes you out of the state of defending yourself or trying to protect yourself from the feeling of not being seen. When you're consumed with that, when you're consumed with, but this person doesn't see me, 
um, and you're and you're feeling the the real kind of angst and 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 upset from not being seen, that distracts you from being present in the now. Whereas when that's aside and you're already feeling like, okay, I have been seen and I've seen, so we are now in a place of seeing one another, then the conversation changes. The quality of the conversation changes. It's not me versus you now because there's a common understanding of the, the full picture. Now it is how do we best manage this to the best of, and, and, and you know, there's a, a law of, of re reciprocity where when you really understand someone else's needs and you really try to meet their needs, they feel a natural urge to want to try to meet yours. And that's what builds strong bonds. That's what builds relationships is when, when you put your hand out and go, here, here's a way you can meet that need or let me help you meet that need. And I know this is important to you. Let's try make it work. Then you're creating the conditions and the motivation for the other person to step up and step in in a similar way. And the opposite is also true. <laughs> So the opposite is also true. When we when we go, no, my need is more important than yours. I am actually, you know, I'm going to win this. And it's about me versus you. Then guess what it sets up? It sets up a war. And so we want to just know that whatever step we choose to take, whatever approach we choose to deliver is going to be met in spirit. It's going to be met in a similar fashion from the person that we're engaging with. What we're talking about here in terms of these dynamics is as applicable on a micro level in a family as it is on a macro level between countries, between, uh, you know, any, any sort of conflict, if you think about it, comes down to needs not being met, and in spe specifically the need to be seen. Uh, a lot of these conflicts can really be mediated or at least um, uh, sort of smoothed through a proper process of actual deep emotional and cognitive empathy to really see one another, to really, really, and that doesn't necessarily always mean agreeing. There's a difference yeah. between seeing one another and agreeing. That's two different things. To mm. see someone is to say, I hear you. I see you. I can understand where you're coming from. Doesn't necessarily mean I agree with your decision of what a way forward or whatever. And a disagreement, being able to have courageous conversations around points of disagreement is another topic altogether. Mm. But those, you can imagine how conflictual those disagreements will be when that both parties don't feel seen. Because now you've got yeah. the cognitive uh, dissonance which, or the cognitive differences and you've got the emotional triggering that comes from your need to be seen not being met. It's so true because even, even when I was on my way to the baby shower and, and I was... I was perfectly at peace to drop off the gift because I had really Processed seen it. Quentin. Yeah. Yes, I'd really seen him and I I was really comfortable to go to to just drop off the gift mm -hmm. in my heart of hearts. I was mm -hmm. very, very comfortable and happy to do that. Yeah. Um, so even though we didn't agree in terms of the resolution, it enabled us to both be soft about um accepting each other's points of view yes. also there, there was a deeper understanding of the other person's consideration capacity their capacity to hear us their capacity to consider our needs even in the moment even with you going there was a deeper appreciation of the need to be safe and the need to so it was more top of mind you know it was more this is important. I need to think about it. And now when the 30th came up, you were like, mm, this might be extending too much. Let's, so th there's a capacity to consider the other person 
that the mm. two of you are now demonstrating in a in a deeper way and that mm. that creates more comfort that creates more comfort and there's two states that we're trying to navigate always this comfort and discomfort and as human beings we we move towards comfort and we move away from discomfort Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so what we want to do in our relationships is we want to try to create more comfort because that brings us closer together. Mm. We wanted to, we want to, and so what brings discomfort is having our needs not being met or having them not being seen. How does one keep from going back to the old state and old way of doing things? Because at times, you know, we are with you now, we we're with you last week, and then all of a sudden, what we're doing is done. Yes. And then a year later, we're back to square one. Yes, yes, yes. That's a really, really good question. So I want, I, I want to almost answer that question with, a, um, with another question back to you. Can you think of a skill that you've developed over time? Like writing proposals. Yeah. Yes, brilliant. Okay, writing proposals. I want you to think about the first time that you wrote a proposal. Okay. And now yeah. I want you to think about the times that you write proposals now. How, how has the effort or the difficulty changed? No, I, I can do it in my sleep. <laughs> Exactly. It's not in. It's not intimidating. Even the thought of doing it doesn't frighten the knowledge out of my head. Now, Whereas what is, before, yeah. Yeah. so what's you changed? just be blank because it's a proposal. <laughs> you, you just have to like, write a proposal. <laughs> so what's yeah. changed? What's what has changed from then to is now? Is it the experience of yeah. having done it over and over? Spot on. Spot on. So, so this is relating is a practitioner's art. It like anything singing. So I do vocal training and, uh, you know, when you first learning to sing, you learn all these techniques, but the only way you actually improve and keep those techniques active within your vocal practice is through practice. What that means is that we actually get better at it the more practice we do. So we can't just think we've got it in our minds so it's naturally embodied or embedded in our lives. We need to actually practice and keep it alive. And that's why often coaching programs are over a four to six month period to ensure that one has actually really embedded the behavior before there's a release of the, the kind of accountability conversation. The two of you can also be accountability partners for one another. You know, keeping it alive, keeping the language alive, the notes that you've been taking, like how do you, how do you put them up in like little reminders in ways that, that are helpful? Uh, you know, how do you re-engage and have conversations about what you've learned through the process and how you can apply it. And then also, also knowing that it's okay to slip up every now and again and not holding each other to the standard of perfection. We're not going for perfect, we're going for progress. So your emotional refractory period is the time from when you're emotionally triggered until the time that you've calmed down to a normal state. And what we wanna try and do is we wanna shorten that period. You might find that to start with, you might be triggered for three days, maybe even a whole week. We want to try and do is we want to help you to stay change earlier so that you are not triggered for lengthy periods of time. So even if you mm. get emotionally triggered, you're like, oh, I'm emotionally triggered. I need to stay changed. I need to take some time out. I need to think about what are the needs here? What is the best way forward? How do I see the other person? So that you can actually really, those emotional triggers are not necessarily bad. To be emotionally triggered just means that oh, I'm not seen or oh, there's a way that my need might not get met here. It's a wake up. But if we use it as a, as a wake up, um, and if we use it as a wake up, then it will help us to have courageous conversations. If we don't use it as a wake up and we let the emotional trigger take over, 
then we are not in the driver's seat anymore. The emotion is just carrying us. And usually it carries us into more conflict. Good. I think this, this um, emotional refract refractory period um, is such a, a big eye opener, right? Because then we can prolong, or let me say, by shutting down and avoiding having the courageous conversation, I then lengthen this emotional refractory period where then I'm now triggered for a week longer than I actually had to be. Yeah. Had I then understood that, okay, I am triggered. It is awakening me to a, a need that I feel is being threatened. Mm -hmm. it, and I can then ask my questions of what is Quentin's need? Is, my, is this need really a need or a want? Yeah. Where is it actually coming from? Is it really being threatened? or I'm just um, being defensive uh, um, yes. because of all patterns. Yes. So aiming to really engage each other and shorten the refractory period is, mm -hmm. is so important because that's when you find that relationships fall into an emotional refractory period of years. Mm -hmm. You don't even realize. Mm -hmm. And because it's been years of you being emotionally triggered, you've numbed out from each other yeah. because that's just the, the better way to, to survive that's it. In, the, in, in the relationship. Wow. Remember that an emotion that's dragged over a, leng a, a longer period becomes a mood. So in a relationship, if your emotions, both emotions, are, both people's emotions are being dragged into moods, then it becomes almost an emotional uh, sort of environment of the relationship starts to becoming mm. like one big mood it's almost like a um and it's not something that is permanent it is something that can change but it needs consciousness to change it needs awareness mm -hmm. and it, it takes effort you know one needs to be aware we are stuck in a certain mood in our connection or we're stuck in a certain emotional pattern or dynamic and how are we going to shift out of that? And so this takes me full circle back to when we spoke about the definition of love in our early conversations being micro moments of positive resonance. So these, these short periods of time where two people can have positive emotions that amplify. Compassion is when there's a negative emotion on the one side and the other person feels that negative emotion enough to want to help the other person to relieve them of that negative emotion. That's mm -hmm. compassion. So we want love and compassion. We want where there's positive emotions, we want to be able to share and amplify the positive emotion. And when there's a negative emotion, we want to be seen in that negative emotion in a compassionate way to lift that mood. And, and that's how we create moments of love in our relationships, because not all relationships are loving relationships or love-filled relationships. Sometimes there are relationships that are completely devoid of moments of love, which is shared positive resonance. And you can also have shared positive re resonance with a stranger. You could have a, like a really beautiful moment with somebody that you, that you meet, even the teller behind that, if you share a joke and you both laugh or whatever, that's a moment of love. So it's, what's important to remember is that love is something that we can share when we fill ourselves up with positive emotion, when we activate positive emotions in ourselves and we want to share those positive emotions with others. I think for me, what's hitting me now, I feel like I'm talking about, no. <laughs> is, the, is the compassion um, piece because sometimes when Quentin is feeling down, I, I sometimes then distance myself mm -hmm. because I don't know how to, to bring him up. Right. Or I think I'm giving him space, but really what I'm doing is I'm not doing the, the work of empathizing with him in, in, his, in his moment mm -hmm. and helping him to, to, to lift him up by really understanding where he's coming from. Right. Right. So the compassion is really hit, hitting me hard mm. in, 
it, it just goes back to the 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 dangers of shutting down mm, mm, mm. is that re- you really distance yourself from people who love you and who yes. you love yes. by shutting down yes. because yes. compassion requires you go in there with the person mm. and go okay I see I see what yes. you're grappling with and yes. I tend to distance myself when yes. Quentin yes. Is, is going through um Yes. And like he must deal with it himself over yes. there. And then yes. he must come back when he's fine yes. instead of engaging him and saying, Babe, I can see that you're mm-hmm. you're feeling a little bit low. Mm-hmm. What's up? How can I Yeah, but it's not you alone. I mean, I think there has been a narrative at some point um that men are left to deal with the darkness on their own. Yeah. So we, we, we even know that, you know, which is why you'll find that habits of men when they're going through hardship are almost mm. the same. Yeah. We isolate, we distance ourselves. Yeah. And, it's, it's, and with the reaction from our partners or our wives or girlfriends is also to... Like, oh, he's going through stuff. Just mm. leave him alone. Mm. And so, you know, that's that's how I'm programmed as well. At, at times, mm. it's not that you have a choice in the matter. Mm. I just mm. withdraw. Mm. 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 Yeah, mm. and it is. Because like, I didn't know this was stress right now, for example. Mm. I, I, mm. I wasn't aware of the level of stress mm. that you were experiencing. Yes. You know, and I there was a deal with it over there and then mm. come back when you've when you've hunted and come back with the mm. animal that mm. we can all mm. eat. It is such an important realization in that this is actually a societal conditioning response. It's like it's, it's a response that we have based on conditioning and programming. Like you correctly said, Kurt, like we've been programmed. It's not necessarily what's best for us, but it has been the way we've done things. What, what stood out for you? Just touching base to the previous session that we had and how that played out afterwards mm. uh, and how it's about you seeing me is you having an awareness to my need for safety. Mm-hmm. That's what it brought, and me having an awareness for your your need for connection. Mm-hmm. So when you see someone deeply, that's what you see. Mm-hmm. When you see someone on the surface, it's the everyday things. So I see you on the surface. I see you in the everyday things. Mm-hmm. A lot of people see each other in the everyday mm-hmm. things. Mm-hmm. You see, I see money in the everyday. So that awareness has also made me question, oh, actually, you know, even outside of ourselves, you know, people I love, like my, my, my daughter, what's, yeah. what deep seeing have I missed of us? She was saying, but um, it's not that you will, we will come to an agreement but the point of seeing each other is to soften towards one another. Yes, so that awareness as well helps me to soften. Once you have an awareness of this need of being seen, it extends out. You, you look at Mali differently now. You go, okay, is she behaving like this because we haven't spent time together and she has a need for connection that I'm not meeting? Mm. Instead of Mali is being annoying. I mean, I, I won't say that all of a sudden I'm just that this guru, but yes, yes. there is a place to go to in terms of trying to understand the people, the people around us. And I think for me, biggest thing that came out of this session was the, the definition of compassion. I think that really struck me um, in the sense that you think you're a compassionate person, right? without really having an understanding of what compassion actually is. That compassion is, is not calling out from you know, the top of the hill to go, you'll be fine. 
Call me when you're fine. It's going down the hill and going, what's up? And uh, a lot of, uh, I've been very afraid of, of doing that. Slash, I thought you didn't need that from me, right? You're a man, you can figure it out on your own. Was my convenient story that I was able to tell myself. No, it was your conditioning. Yeah. Too. I, I think uh, yeah. we can't escape that. The it yeah. is a conditioning from our mothers and fathers, from our brothers and sisters, just from society in general. As a woman, the, the way in which you view compassion, especially towards a man, is not the same as towards a child. I feel mm. like towards a child, you can, you can go down mm. to the bottom. Yeah. To bring that child up but with the man it's not the same yeah or with a friend with the friend mm. you, you can do it but as well i don't think with the male friend no. it's the same no. i don't think with the brother it's the same no. you might do it for a sister yes but yes. You, you see so it's a societal it's a societal condition which yeah. like shannon was saying it's, it's just gonna be to undo that, it's, it needs a lot of work from people in their own spaces mm -hmm. and over time it can be... One for me was the what? emotional refractory period and that, um, you know, the space between being emotionally triggered and um, coming down and being able to engage when I shut down prolongs that, that that period because in a way in that moment I'm avoiding or I'm missing out on a potential to be intimate with you or to have an intimate discussion and engaged discussion about a particular a particular issue uh, and the, the thing with courageous conversations is that at times there is we miss as people to say that party that is willing to have the conversation and just bring it forward we think that they also have no fears where they have mm, yeah. so you know your willingness to have a courageous conversation is a is you willing to be vulnerable to see the other person it goes back to yes <laughs> To see the other person to be seen too, mm. uh, but it's 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 a, 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 at times it's, it's to be seen, you know, because as well to be seen, we have to understand that there's vulnerability mm. for me to show you me, mm. and there's a difference between saying that no, uh, the energy is wrong, mm -hmm. so let's revisit, mm -hmm. but then shutting down is neither. Yeah, it's it's it's, it's just. I'm just going to disengage and I'm yes. going to wait for the storm to pass and then I'm going to pretend like the storm didn't just Yes, the uh, storm didn't just happen and <laughs> blow the roof and blow mm. these things. Let's continue. I, I, need, I need to look at it from a cognitive um, empathy point of view to go, okay, these are the emotions I'm feeling and I acknowledge them. Um, and ask my questions, what is the other person feeling? Because the problem with staying in emotional empathy is that it can also be very one-sided about my emotions and what I am feeling and then also trying to protect those feelings. But if I'm able to, to step into the cognitive side to go, what need is being um, made up, you know, apparent in this moment? What is Quentin needing? What am I needing? How can we, you know, find a way to, you know, those exercises where you, you put the two needs and then the, the concerns is cognitive empathy. It's going, okay, here is the situation. Let us put it down and we're both trying to find a resolution by using cognitive and emotional um, empathy to get to a, a place of at least seeing and resolving. The, also, I think, you know, you asked such a brilliant question of how do we not fall back into, into you know, the defaults? Because at the end of the day, um, we have built pathways in our brains that shortcut us into responses. Mm -hmm. And so there's going to be some work.
that both of us need to do to be able to, you know, go into cognitive empathy or go into emotional empathy because those, those pathways are not practiced. So I'm so glad that you asked that question because a lot of the time you think, oh, now that I know, it's just going to be an automatic natural thing. But like she said, what did she say? She said something so sexical. Um, relating is a practitioner's art. Yes. And yeah, it, it practice, practice makes perfect. And I also want to say thank you so much for being willing to go on this journey because you could have said no. And you know, I think most uh, gentlemen would have been hard pressed to put out their relationship. Um, like this and so thank you for being willing to come down into the pit so that we can no, rise no. again together i'm i'm a sucker for progress <laughs> i like things that move forward i like yeah. things that get better i like yeah uh, so if there's an opportunity to make our relationship better or to make someone else's relationship better i'm i'm for that i'm excited for next week's episode or next week's session where we'll be dealing with the you know the feminine and the masculine elements within us and how they play out in societal conditioning and and yeah. and, and, and as, as as a man and i'm sure the other men would attest to it it's an everyday battle to balance that because the training and the conditioning is very masculine based and even the reactions you are you, as a guy you know you're taught if we don't agree then we fight mm. that's why the world at the moment because it's led by masculine energy if we don't agree we drop we're not dropping bombs, bombs now we go drop bombs we we harm each other so mm. if the other person doesn't agree with you the only way to change them is through force mm. And um, it happens in, so, in, so, in, so, in society, it happens in, in households. Husband and wife don't agree, and the only way to, to change their mind is a forceful way to some people. And I think then throwing loose things like be a man and be this and be this. And sometimes you even hear those words from women who consider themselves to be, be feminist or to be more woke. Mm. But for me, that BMN line is the loosest thing one can say to a man. Mm -hmm. Because if your example of a man was someone who's abusive, and then you like being, being a man is being dead. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, we're always watching these cartoons of a child who was raised by wolves. Mm -hmm. That child, being a man is being a wolf. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's, that's what being a man is. Mm. So I think we need to be careful with that because um, a lot of men have been conditioned to be masculine. They've been conditioned to be closed. They've been conditioned to be ag aggressive. And unemotional. Right? And Having emotions, emotions is wrong. You don't have permission is a to have emotions. Yeah. And in fact, that's when the line "be a man" is usually used by a woman or man, is when a man is showing their emotion. Yeah, then no. you are told, "Be a man." Yes, we are taught to suppress, suppress, mm. suppress, suppress. So there's a lot of that going on in society. guys for staying with us uh, I know that you got a lot of great nuggets of wisdom just watching it again for myself I remembered some great tips that I need to reapply into my life so please share with us in the comments below what stood out for you and what tool do you think will be most useful for your relationship whatever relationship that may be and so let us grow heal and thrive together I love you